morning, Dr. Michael Fisher, one of the fierce philosophers in the world right now. And you might wonder, fierce philosopher, what is that? Well, um, just to start with, this is what this video is all about. It's uh, my little book promotion here on philosophy of fearism, a primer. Uh, just came out, and I'll just read the back cover, um, let you know a quick summary of what this book is about. I feel like it's a legacy publication for me after many decades of studying fear and fearlessness and then into the philosophy of fearism itself. This book is the first short summary of the main concepts, the history, and the importance of the new field of philosophy of fearism. This serves as a primer introductory study book for those interested in the nature and role of fear from the alternative critical lens of the fearist thinkers. For example, Desh Suba, Sam and Jillian, and others obviously myself included. The book contains an easy to read differentiation of fearism from merely studying fear. This transdisciplinary approach advances the world's thought on fear management education for the 21st century. And then the little bio about me, if you haven't heard my work before, uh, Dr. R. Michael Fisher, PhD, is a Canadian artist, philosopher, independent scholar, educator, fearologist. He is director of the In Search of Fearlessness Research Institute and an author of the many articles and books on transformation and liberation. He is founder of this and senior editor of the International Journal of Fear Studies and recipient of the 2019 Tilmati Fearism Award out of Nepal, started by Desh Suba. So um, I want to read a little bit from the book, just give you a little introduction, give you a sense of the table of contents of the book as well, but I thought, first of all, as I was thinking of presenting this book to do a short little lecture in really my celebration of the book coming out, which I feel is, is really, as I say, a summary of this trajectory I've taken since 1989. So I'll just go up to a screen share and start that little short lecture um, with you. My PowerPoint here. So it's a fear inquiry. That's what all of my work has been about. And that fear inquiry is really encompasses particularly these years. Now that does not mean I was not interested in the nature and role of fear in more indirect way before 1989. I certainly have been somebody's thinking very intensely about the nature of humans, nature itself, reality itself, the future of the planet, and how to actually manage all of that in a good, transformative, and healthy way. So I have a long commitment to this knowledge path, you might call it, and a very critical knowledge path as well. So 1989 was a special beginning, and there's a whole story about that when I started the In Search of Fearlessness project. Won't go into that. There are certainly other publications and places you can read on the internet about that history and how I got into it, why, how life-changing it was for me. So the idea I want to share today is really, what does this fear inquiry, how did it shape out and become what it did? And in that blue sphere is really what it's all about. An inquiry is always keeping the question there as just as important as any answers that might come from the question. And that even when you have an answer, you're ready to move on to the questions beyond that answer. And so that will give a philosophical tone, and it's a good scientific tone to this inquiry into fear. So the first thing I did from the very earliest days of 89, when I began to say, okay, I've got to really collect the data, do the research, see what are the facts, if I can even come to a notion of facts, and then what are the definitions and meanings that go and how are they created with this notion of fear? Fear being in a sense an English word. So it's arbitrary in another way. It might be understood by different people in different languages and different modalities of brain development, children, adults, elders, whatever the case may be, we all do not come to the word fear in the same way. So that is, again, part of a fear inquiry. I keep that open-ended. 
But I wanted to know what were the fear teachings that were available on the planet. And those were just basically anybody who spoke and wrote about fear, wherever I could collect that data, I just kept compiling, compiling, compiling. So you have to be a bit of a maniac and uh, you'll see why I wanted to do that. Because I felt there was a domain in this big blue sphere that was beyond those fear teachings. That just sort of started emerging. Maybe it was a hypothesis. I'm not sure how I came to think that way, but I always thought, the fear teachings touch into and they help indicate they are perhaps representative of some kind of reality or truth of what we'll just call fear with that particular four letter word troublesome as it is to define but has many meanings as well as i just said this is a very open wide inquiry and what i realized my first kind of conclusion i suppose was probably oh, a lot of people are saying the same thing about fear teachings. What if they're not all right? And they just keep reproducing the not so right, or just let's say incomplete and, or even in some cases, distorted teachings about fear. So everything I looked at, what people said, taught about, teach, wrote, published, you know, it didn't matter if that was from common peoples or to people who were an elite, you know, sophisticated academic institutions creating this knowledge about fear. That didn't matter to me. And also could be from the church, right, or the state. This creation of the meaning of fear and how we're best to, supposed to manage it is all about understanding. It's all about this inquiry. How do we understand? And I kept saying, I think it's incomplete. And I could see a lot of repetition. I wondered about it. It felt like nobody's really thinking that holistically now, nowadays that's a word we can kind of understand and the other word i use is they weren't thinking very integral and that means in a multi-dimensional multi-perspectival intersecting of ways and perspectives to understand a phenomenon of fear so on that path very quickly and really it was in late 18, 1989 that i already was interested in fearlessness and there's a story behind that which again i won't go into it's a longer story but the idea of looking at fear from a fearlessness perspective and so then i went to study who is talking about fearlessness and how do they write about it maybe they use the word fearless maybe they use the word without fear freedom from fear anything that was about fearlessness right taking away from then i also, almost simultaneously, I can't remember, you know, that far back exactly in how I also became interested in, well, if I don't think those fear teachings are getting to all or enough of the territory of this inquiry into the truth and reality of fear and the phenomenon of fear, I then sort of thought, and this is not all just about humans, by the way, this, is, this includes all creatures, all beings, and perhaps even beyond what we normally think of as visible beings or material beings. So wide open inquiry again, even the invisible world, the animated world of spirit, if you will. So I saw, well, let's put something plus onto fear to indicate that there's more to fear than what those fear teachings typically, traditionally are about. That encompasses more. So that's where fear plus came in. And the word fear, fearism, F-E-A-R-I-S-M, which I just showed you the title of this book, Philosophy of Fearism, that I just completed, is obviously a fear plusing. I plussed fear with an ISM. And I'm not the only one that was doing fear plusing. That's another concept. I'm not going to try to give a lecture on that today. But it was a positive approach to the study of fear, this fear inquiry. Positive meaning. I added on components that I thought would guide and lead and expand the traditional fear teachings. Fearlessness teachings was a similar kind of addition or complementary approach to inquiry to advance the fear teachings of the world. But I used this negative approach, fear less. It's got this lessness. So it's like, what can I take out of our approach to fear, take out some things, 
and that I would perhaps find another way to get to the source, this core of the reality and truth of fear. So it was really these two domains that became my work, if you want to say that. And I was in, obviously integrating always what are other people doing of these same negativa approach or a positiva approach. And that I would just keep adding and synthesizing and synthesizing all these different methodologies and perspectives. And in the end, I was taking an approach that was emergent, meaning constantly expanding, as I said, answering questions, backing off the, the answer when you got it, not settling for it, asking the more deep questions of inquiry, and an ever endless infinite exploration. That is the emergent mind. That is the mind that is creative, ongoing. This is like the child's mind. You just keep thinking of new possibilities that are strange and weird. A lot of my work is in regard to fear. It's not straight up in that sense. It's not functional only. What good is it for? I ask much bigger questions than that. So in the end, um, it's a transformative approach of inquiry. So if you're interested in a transformative approach to fear inquiry, that means that I am also interested in not only how fear as a concept, as a phenomenon is constantly emerging and transforming itself. It's alive and dynamic pretty basic assumption from my point of view, it is. And I am dynamic, evolving, changing. My relationship with fear in this inquiry as a fear researcher, in the end, what I call the study of fearology is all of this, which includes the red and the black on the other side. All of that is the interest of a fearologist. So yeah, I've self-named that just because I thought it needed to be renamed psychology of fear is the most common type of information available today. And I have problems with that being mostly on the black side, uh, as I said, more traditional and a very common, commonsensical as well, way to understand fear. Inadequate, partial, incomplete, and sometimes distortive because it is such a disciplinary idea, especially as psychology moved away from philosophy and became this very much more trying to be a science and all the paradigms of restriction that that psychology tried to produce so that we get this knowledge about all kinds of things. And of course, fear being then labeled and named both as an emotion, which philosophy did, which theology sort of did, uh, and that tradition of fear is an emotion and a feeling. Well, again, that a particular framing, definition, and meaning that I am not satisfied because I see it as so partial to the overall need for a fear inquiry. So fearology became the sort of study of fear and its relationship with all life. That's my basic definition. There's more complex definitions I've created. And the philosophy of fearlessness grew as I was doing this transformative work because my own philosophy and my sense of self was also transforming and changing in major ways. The very notion of what philosophy is or psychology is or any discipline also was changing. This is why I became more and more transdisciplinary, which means I, I use as many disciplines as I can and I go beyond their way of thinking and perspectives as well so that I can inquire into fear in this emergent, creative, transformative way and then I, philosophy of fear is really another way to think about the whole project of fear inquiry as well. And I draw in, again, all these different approaches to a philosophy of fear. And in the end, I end this talk, brief as it is, I think it's the most clear picture I've had of being able to explain my work in 33 years. So um, I'm pretty excited about sharing this with you. It, fear management education is really the final word or term concept. And fear management slash education means that anytime humans are interested in the notion of fear, they are already pre-conditioned and pre-interested in fear because we want to manage it better. And that, of course, is a very complex notion. What does it mean to manage fear and better? huge concepts that I play with a lot 
um, that you can read about in this book, um, The Philosophy of Fearism. So this book is about the fear plusing, right? It's not about the fearlessness per se work. I have many other books on that and articles and videos and so on on fearlessness focus. So it's really two branches that I came to to the study of adding to the fear inquiry of traditional fear studies or fear teachings. All right, so um, I think that might give you a better big perspective of what fearism is. And I'm not going to try to define it, but um, there is a really interesting statement I found in the book. Uh, you know, I just wrote it and published it, but everyone I'm flipping through it, I go, oh, yeah, I remember that quote I have from Desh Suba, who is the Nepali um, philosopher, poet, um, interesting thinker who wrote the first major book called The Philosophy of Fearism in 2014. That story is all in here. The characters, the people, how Desh Suba and I interacted is in here. So I think for the new student reading fearism or those who know a bit about the fearism work and want to get as good a clarity as possible, at least as a foundation, not that I have all of the picture. I paint a portrait here of what fearism is. But Desh Suba, I do vignettes of three philosophers discovering fearism. And that's for Desh Suba, and Sam Injilian, and myself. And Desh Suba's quote here, I really think is, says so much in a few words. He, he's a kind of a master of that. And that's his poet um, literary background that he has. That really was his strength for you know, decades and decades. And then he came up with the idea of this fearism. And people said, well, that's an interesting term. How could we put that into literary criticism and philosophy? And he just took off with it about around 1999 plus into those next years. But here's he, what he has for fearism as one of its meanings. I said one because there's many meanings to fearism, just like there is with fear. Quote, the philosophy that fear itself is bringing into the world, end quote. It's a marvelous notion when you think about it. The philosophy that fear itself is bringing into the world. I write, read just a couple paragraphs that follow that quote. Before I write on the three pillars, this triad of fearism, there is something I want to share of the kind that comes now and then with that aha moment, the uncanny, where my whole being is struck with not just the words, but something behind the words I utter when speaking and or writing about philosophy of heroism. There, this, I'm speaking right now to the emergent. Uh, there's something emergent. This is like I've spent you know, decades on this work around fear and even on fearism since 2014. And my work, even going back to fearism, back to the 1990s, first used it. It's like I'm still captivated by a creative emergent impulse. And uh, this is the aha moment while writing this book. The above quote is one of those moments. In my researching to write this section of the primer, I was listening to a spontaneous interview I did with James Ellis on his Hermetics podcast nearly two years ago. And I noticed in a new way what I had just said, the orientation of how I had long imagined fearism as a philosophy, a la Suba, just reversed itself. I mean that in a good way, but it is a bit shocking at some level. The above quote claims that Suba or I made up fears and philosophy all from our will or ego or ID alone. No, the quote above raises at least the possibility that the source of fearism came from the world happening the way it is, was happening. And Suba and I were receivers, not makers of the impulse for what needed to be birthed. The gestation was already there in humanity. 
or maybe in the universe itself. In other words, it is a good reversal to shift one's imaginary at times from the comfortable and habitual way of thinking of origins and sources of causality. And I coined this term as if I'm the origin of it. Creation is two-way. In that sense, it is co-mutual. And I would add, co-emergent, transformative, creative. So in simple terms, the good philosopher is paying close attention is feeling deeply, is involved, and is co-mutually creating things that need, desire, question mark, to be created at a particular moment. There is some mystery to this desiring universe of possibilities. There is an aliveness to everything. All being, capital B, is not inside my head my will to power, my ego, my thought. This perspective is how I understand discovery theorism. I think that would be probably my alternative title, discovering theorism, the primer. Not as if it is from one point of human source. No, fear itself brought the philosophy of theorism and for that reason, it seems to me something to ponder as to, so, quote, who is the teacher here, end of quote. Is the teacher me? Is it Suba? Is it Jillian? Maybe the teacher is fear itself. I use a capital F on fear at that point. I mean fear with the capital that is that fear plusing approach and the fearlessness negative approach as this re 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 rich re alivening study in a fear in those traditional knowledges where we can get caught into settling too easily too quickly into oh i know what fear is oh here's fear and we'll just author after author after author of the tens of thousands of authors I've looked at and how they produce and share the knowledge on fear and this management and education. That's what they're doing. They're educating us. Uh, as an educator, as a fearologist, as a fearist philosopher, I question all of that teaching and how they do it. That's what I look at. How is your curriculum design? What's your philosophy behind it? What's your pedagogy? How self-critical are you in claims? And do you let the buyer beware? The buyer being the listener, the reader, those who are, in some sense, vulnerable to your knowledge. And, and there's no way to avoid that. We are vulnerable to new knowledge because new knowledge, if we're actually learning something, kicks out something that we've already learned that we have to change and transform. And that's actually painful. There's a whole psychoanalytic theory of unlearning and learning that is really profound. And, and in a sense, as Jillian says in this book, and in his work, his two books, uh, there's a, it's terrifying to learn. It's terrifying to be educated. And he actually thinks that that's not a bad thing in a good way, not terrorizing people into learning but that there is an ontological defect potential there. So don't want to get into that, but that was just a little cue or a little piece. And you can read about Sam and Jillian Jr.'s work in here, as well as Desh Suba, as well as mine, and several other people who have followed and or added to or complemented or come parallel to us as fierce thinkers. And they are very interested in the philosophy of fear as well and fearism. So just to give you a sense of how I covered the book in the table of contents, the introduction is what's in a name, why focus on fearism. Next chapter, history and people behind the philosophy of fearism. The next one, an intellectual movement in philosophy and beyond. And just a little cue or sneak preview as to the philosophical history trajectory of how philosophy of fearism arose. Um, 
Desub and I agree that certainly comes out of certain Stoic philosophies, but philosophies of the East, even before that, an interest in fear and in fearlessness as a liberation path. Stoic philosophers, their understanding of fear and a liberation path, the Greeks, and then existentialism, much more of the modern approach to understanding fear and how to, in a sense, not just liberate ourselves from it, but learn to accept it and move beyond its limitations, but be also connected to what it gets us in touch with in the reality of our ontological threatened vulnerable being as an organic being. And of course, the search for self, meaning, authenticity that goes with existentialism. Theorism is the next branch. That's really the point of this work. That's one way to understand it's the next branch, we believe, of that chain from Stoicism through existentialism onward. That's particularly in the West I'm speaking about. Okay, and then the last section is on fears and theory. And I have a few subsections, which I'll just read underneath there. Fears and theory. What philosophers would think of fearism. A few theorists' imperatives. A few theories within fearism. Some philosophical assumptions and principles. And the last section of that is some critics of fearism. So that's part of the nature of this book is to give a foundation because it's got so many differences and at the same time to give the critiques that are coming at it all part of the fear inquiry thanks for very much for listening today and let's continue the conversation on the philosophy of fearism fear plusing fear negative as in the fearlessness tradition of branch whatever your interests in the idea that we ought to and can be producing good fearology and fearologists in the future. I believe this is a career for people. This is a new path for those who really want to dig into all the fear problems and the fear potentials and transcending and or, as we say, liberating beyond the most limiting toxic conditions of fear. Thanks for this today in this summary. Uh, Appreciate your attention and feel free to pass this book review on.